Hello, and thank you for joining. I'm Jenna Pache, Director of Marketing and Communications for the Sullivan Group, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today. We have just a few housekeeping items before we get started. After we're done here today, there'll be a short evaluation that'll pop up. Uh, please take a few minutes and share your feedback with us. Let us know if there are other webinar topics that you'd like to see, and if you have any technical issues today, please feel free to chat directly to RSQ Solutions on the right hand of your screen or shoot us an email. As we go through the webinar, you are welcome to enter your questions in the chat or Q&A box on the right hand side. We have reserved time at the end today for your questions, but feel free to enter them as we go through today's webinar. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Uh, Brant Roth is our Chief Marketing Officer with the Sullivan Group, and we're also honored to have with us Doug Wachesik, the founder of Sorry Works. So with that, I will turn it over to Brant. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you everyone for taking time to join today. Um, our topic today is saying sorry, empathy and communication strategies after an adverse event. And on the outset here, we're going to give a brief background on the Sullivan Group and then turn it over to Doug to talk about uh, the topic of discussion. Next slide. Oops, sorry. The Sullivan Group was started in uh, 1998 by Dr. Dan Sullivan with an emergency medicine background and a legal background, and our goal and mission has always been to leverage technology to deliver uh, solutions that actually change clinical practice, improve patient safety, and reduce medical malpractice claims. At this point, 18 years later, we have a, a fairly large national impact. We're delivering online education to over 70,000 clinicians each year, and uh, those 70,000 clinicians are working in 900 acute care environments across the country. Next slide. Fortunately, we've had the opportunity to work with many large uh, integrated health systems across uh, the country. Many of these folks have, have been with us quite some time, several of these over 10 years, and many of the other large organizations that we work with are, are coming on board with some of the new programs that we have available. Next slide, please. I think a lot of the expansion of our development has, has the genesis of that is with this risk collaborative. This is a group of individuals that are subject matter experts and, and clinical champions in their field uh, that work with us to deliver the online programs that we deliver to to our large our large clients. Um, next slide, please. And at this point, uh, we have a number of offerings, and our platform spans across the entire uh, arena of healthcare, both into the enterprise world uh, as well as into the high risk uh, solution world. But today's topic is, is based on communication and resolution, and at this time I'd like to turn it over to, to uh, Doug Wachesik to talk about the topic of the discussion today. Sure. Uh, thanks, Brant. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I always start my presentations by saying thank you um, to folks uh, taking time out of your day to, to join us. And um, you know, just a brief background uh, on myself. A lot of you know who I am. I'm, I'm the founder of Sorry Works. We were founded back in 2007. Uh, we have trained over 30,000 healthcare, insurance, and legal professionals. We've developed a, a lot of content uh, around this topic and, and really have a laser focus on uh, disclosure, apology, uh, and how, how things should be uh, for not only patients and families but also clinicians uh, after something uh, has gone wrong. Hey, I, today I'm going to give you a, a look at our at how we train frontline people, uh, frontline staff uh, with disclosure and apology. Uh, I, I'm going to show you the actual presentation or some of the actual presentation that we have uh, when we go out and, and work with the frontline staff in, in hospitals, uh, long-term care facilities, uh, and on behalf of insurance companies and law. Firms. And uh, it's really all about getting connected pre-event and then staying connected post-event, and then you know. The, the, you know, as I go through content with frontline staff, I, I always tell people if, if there's one thing you can remember out of this whole presentation, I'll say the same thing to you. If, if I can get frontline staff to simply sit down, say sorry, and then call someone, sit down, say sorry, then call someone when something goes wrong. If they can sit down, say sorry, then call someone, you know, sit down and say sorry to a patient or family and then call someone in leadership uh, if something goes wrong, we will be miles ahead uh, of where we are today uh, in, in healthcare. Um, so 
a couple of key questions and considerations to kind of frame, uh, you know, my presentation to you today. Uh, you know, why do we do adverse events, and then, you know, how do we effectively, you know, communicate post-events, stay connected with the uh, families and patients uh, without premature or any fault. So, you know, wh why do we do disclosure? You know, it, obviously it's ethical, it's, it's the right thing to do, uh, you know, not too tough to understand there. You know, it, it's what we all want. Uh, as consumers, you know, and when I say consumers, I'm not just talking consumers of healthcare. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, talking consumers in general. You know, uh, whether you go out and have, a, you know, something wrong with your car or a lousy meal at a restaurant, uh, or, or you know, have a bad stay at a hotel. Uh, you, we all know what we want. We know we want to be treated a certain way. We want to have uh, uh, feel heard. We want someone to empathize with us, and we want someone to be connected with us and help us fix the problem, whatever that fix may be. Um, so that's. that's that's, you know, it's no surprise when people come into uh, doctor's offices and hospitals and long-term care facilities that they want the same thing, too, uh, when something goes wrong. But as, as we all know, uh, that, that's not been the case for far too long. Uh, so it's what we want. It's ethical. It's also the smart thing to do. Uh, you know, there's plenty of data coming out now showing that, showing that disclosure does reduce losses and litigation expenses and, and what I call acts of revenge. When I, when I talk to frontline staff, I, I, I say, you know, don't call it a lawsuit. Don't call it a, 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 a complaint to the regulatory board or a, a, a email to a newspaper reporter, I, I say consider it an act of revenge. When a patient or family like myself, and my family has been through adverse medical events several times, when we do those things, we are uh, um, yeah, you know, we, we, we are we are taking our frustrations out on you. We, we we are we are getting our revenge, if you will. And 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 the way you prevent that is, you know, to stay connected with us. Uh so it it's been shown to increase patient safety and resident safety. You learn from previous events. And then I think you know one of the hot topics in healthcare today is the whole second victim issue, you know, how doctors and nurses suffer emotionally after something goes wrong. Well, the only way those folks can get the help they need is, is to be able to talk about it, and not only be able to talk about it with patients and families, but be able to talk about it with each other, be be transparent uh, with everybody, including themselves, and, and get the help they need. So, you know, it, it's a huge issue, and, and, and there's so many so many benefits uh, to why we do this thing called uh, disclosure. Uh, so, how do you how do you communicate effectively post event and stay connected with with families without premature or imminent fault? This is a, a big question mark for a lot of clinicians. Uh, when I do my normal trainings, when I'm, when I'm in in house at a hospital, I often throw up a, a case. Um, you know, the case is a CT guided biopsy of the liver. You know, a routine uh, procedure uh, that goes tragically wrong. And, and I finish the case by saying, okay, imagine you know, I'm I'm the husband whose wife just died. You know, I was supposed to take her out to dinner tonight. Uh, instead, I'm going to be going to a funeral home, picking out a casket. I have to tell my children, mom's never coming home, got to deal with my in-laws. Uh, what are you going to say to me in that moment? You know, this, this is a, you know, everyone told me this would be no big deal, which often it is, but for some reason it turned into a, a catastrophic deal. Uh, what do you say to me? And, and when I put that, you know, I start a presentation, I put that uh, to uh, frontline staff and say, okay, let's, let's role play that one. At the beginning of the talk, before I've trained them, a lot of them have no idea what to say. It's a very uncomfortable experience for them. I see lots of, you know, lots of eyes going to the floor, uh, you know, they may you know, blurt out a couple things here and there, but it's usually, it's usually not a smooth deal. And then I say, well, that's that's why I'm here today to help you guys, and that's why I'm here on the phone today with you folks. So, so this slide right here, I think this is kind of the crux of understanding, you know, how do you stay connected post-event? And you remember I told you if there's one thing we could, if there's one thing that you can hopefully remember or your staff remember about the sit down, say sorry, then call someone, if there's one slide, if there's one slide in this whole deck that if you want to pull out one slide and uh, and keep it, um, you know, photocopy it, plaster it everywhere, share it with your colleagues, this would be the one slide that you would do. I mean, I mean all the slides in the deck are good, but this one is, is kind of the, if there's one you're going to keep, this would be it. Because for so long, when, when I speak to doctors and nurses who are, say, north of 35 years old, most of them will tell me that they were specifically instructed in medical school, nursing school, however they came up uh, through the ranks, uh, never never to say sorry to a family after something goes wrong, because that's an admission of fault. In fact, they were told just to get away from the family, abandon the family, get away, uh, let the lawyers handle it from here, let the risk, man the risk manager do the talking. So uh, we have to we have to turn that ship around, and, and it starts with this right here. It's, it's, it's understanding the difference between empathy and apology. I'm sorry this happened. I feel bad for you. 
that's one thing. That's empathy. That's not admission of fault. That's just simply one human being saying to another, hey, I care about you. I'm, I'm sad that you're sad. Apology is, I'm sorry I made this mistake. It's all my fault. Uh, that's admission of fault. Uh, so what we tell people is empathy is appropriate 100% of the time. It, it, it's what people want when something goes wrong. We all know, everybody on this phone call knows that one of the leading drivers of litigation, one of the, the leading reasons people show up in plaintiff's lawyer's offices and it comes out in deposition after deposition is nobody said they were sorry which is code for people like me, patients and families who've experienced stuff, but that's kind of our, our, our language of saying no one acted like they cared. We only do an apology after there's been a credible review. You know, and that, that's an important point to drive home. You know, you're quick to empathize, you pause before you apologize. Uh, you know, empathy is all about staying connected post event. It's about being pro proactive. It's about running to the problem. It's about running to the problem. You know, for far too long, we've run away from the problem, right? And that's why you all gotten sued. That's why people like me call the medical board. Uh, that's why we call uh, the newspaper in town. And now that's why we get on Facebook and other forms of social media and, you know, just blast you morning, noon, and night. So, so instead, you're going to run to the problem, run to us. And I can't tell you how many risk managers have told me. You know, I go to an ASHRAE meeting or some other risk conference and they, they, they tell me, you know, when me and my staff learn to run to the problem and we taught our staff how to actually run to the problem, because they haven't been trained how to do this. They weren't trained in medical nursing school and they haven't been trained since they graduated. So once we train them how to actually run to the problem, our claims, our litigation went down. Our claims, our litigation went down. So we can practice empathy every day. You don't have to wait for the big, hairy, adverse event to practice empathy. And, and this is important because I was speaking to a, a surgeon in New Hampshire, and, and he's a nice guy, and he said, you know, geez, Doug, I, I'm not very good at saying sorry. Uh, it's not how I was trained, and in many ways it's just not who I am as a person. And, but I understand this is important, but how, how do I get good at it? I said, well, I said, good news for you, Doc. Uh, there's, a, there's literally a thousand things around this hospital every day that frustrate patients and families as well as your colleagues that you can say sorry for, that you can show you care. I'm sorry the test is taking forever. Let me call someone. I'm sorry your dinner's late. I'm sorry your brother doesn't feel better after the procedure. I'm sorry the TV has been broken in your mom's room. I'm sorry you had to wait for the bathroom. How can I help you? All sorts of ways that we can practice empathy. We can also practice empathy by the body language you show. You know, uh, it doesn't cost anyone any more time or, or anything just to simply sit down when they're talking to somebody. But that speaks volumes to patients and families. Showing active listening skills, you know, putting the smartphone away, turning the page off for a second, and actually, you know, having some eye contact and listening. Just giving patients and families uh, some time. I, I was speaking at a, um, a long-term care facility outside Philadelphia, and, and this young staff member came up, was a young part of the management, young guy, part of the management team, he said, you know, when someone's complaining, I try to sit down and give them five minutes of my time. Just five minutes of my time, it's not a, not really a big deal to me, but to these folks who are complaining, it's it's like the most important five minutes of, of their day or even their week. And and he said, you know, in retrospect, those five-minute time blocks are often the best time I spent on any given day because we had off so many problems by someone just simply, like me, just sitting down and giving somebody five minutes. Um, Dealing with that family, you know, this is a big issue in long-term care. It's a big issue in acute care as well. Is you know, we all we all been you know exposed to quote unquote that family. And when I say that family, I'm talking about the really chronic complainers, but potentially abusive complainers, people that are just riding the staff uh, uh, with with no end in sight. And there's a lot of reasons people you know fall in that bucket. Some of it, you know, they've got mental health issues and and other problems at home that. You, know, you can't fix, and all you can do is put boundaries in place and try to manage them. But sometimes people fall in that bucket because no one's listening to them. No one's taking them seriously as they journey through the healthcare system, and every step along the way, they've just gotten a little bit more frustrated and a little bit more belligerent. And if, if and you know, when, when they come into the hospital or come in the nursing home, everyone sees them and they, they they scatter like cockroaches. Well, if if you would simply instead of scattering, run to them, run to the problem. You might be surprised. Uh, the clients I work with tell me sometimes they can turn that family into their biggest fan. So um, a couple more thoughts about practicing empathy every day, practicing this empathy every day so it becomes more of a reflex. Remember that surgeon in New Hampshire. How do we make empathy uh, an, an everyday deal for a person like that? Well, another way we can do it is asking a question of our patients, residents, and families. Whatever 
uh, they leave our presence or we leave their presence, uh, staff should be trained to ask a simple question such as, uh, have we failed to meet your expectations anyway? Or was able, was able to do at least one thing to put a smile on your face? So that's a, a great way to really show that you're trying to Stay connected and, 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 and get their feelings. And, you know, the, the takeaway thought of all of this is, is all this everyday empathy, which is, again, practice, you can wrap this into your HCAPS efforts, the whole patient experience effort. So it, it really should uh, glob onto that. So uh, another way to practice empathy is with each other. You know, uh, healthcare is a, a chaotic, crazy business full of, you know, uh, a lot of times overworked and, and very tired people that can, can bite each other's heads off. You know, another way for your staff to practice empathy is with each other, saying, saying gosh, I'm sorry, you know, I, I took your head off, I, I apologize, uh, can we restart the day? That, that, that really is so important to uh, the camaraderie and, and, the, and the morale of your staff. It, it's also very important to patient safety. You know, we know there's literature that shows when staff does not work well together, errors go up. It impacts, you know, people like me. So a very important thing. So all this empathy, all these empathetic statements with patients, families, and each other on a daily basis is great practice for, you know, when you have that actual adverse event, when, when, uh, when, when the big problem arises. So, so what do you do now? Well, again, I'm back to the slide. Remember this, I said this is the, if there's one slide you're going to save out of this deck, this one, one slide you're going to show everyone on your staff and, 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 and keep in a special spot. This is it because, again, for too long, too many docs and nurses have, have been told and they thought um, and they've been errantly instructed that saying sorry is admitting fault. Not true. Saying sorry is what families want to hear, uh, and it's about context. So let me give you an example <clears throat> of what uh, of an empathetic sorry <clears throat> post-event. Mrs. Smith, your mom's surgery is over and she's in the ICU. I know you're looking forward to taking her home in a few days. You have that big birthday party planned with the grandkids this weekend. However, I'm sorry to tell you the surgery didn't work out the way we expected. I'm so sorry. I can only imagine I'm saying this must be for you. Please know we're doing a review and begin reporting back to you by 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. This review may take a few days or longer, but we'll keep you posted. There's some potholes in the slide. I love to stop when I'm doing training for frontline people. I love to stop and just kind of pause and look at the slide. You look at the first sentence. I can only imagine I'm saying this must be for you. How often do we hear people say, you know, with the best of intentions, I know what you're feeling. I understand what you're going through. And, and the family's sitting there saying, no, you don't. Well, you know, what are you doing to me? You know, now you're making me angry. So replace that with, I can only imagine I'm saying this must be for you. Please know we're doing a review. A lot of people in medicine like to say investigation. And to me, investigation implies somebody done something wrong, we're going to get them. Words count. Words matter. We're doing a review. Uh, hopefully, you know, all of you join this call, you know, even come before you came in, you knew what this was about, was a fair look at what happened, let the chips fall when they may, right? You're certainly getting that impression as I talk about this today. We're not about premature on their fault. We're not about rushing to judgment either way. We want to have an honest look, and if the look shows we made a mistake, well, then we'll take care of that. If not, we'll communicate that. So I think review is more fair to everybody. We'll re we will begin reporting back to you by 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. How often do we hear people say, well, we'll get back to you? We're looking into this. We'll call you sometime next week. You know, don't call us. We'll call you. What that does with patients and families is it drives them bananas. Uh, you know, it, it's not bad enough that we had this adverse event. And my life is very uncertain. Now you've added more uncertainty into I don't know when I'm going to hear from you again. And and uh, every time my phone rings or my email chirps, I'm thinking it's you. But gosh darn, it's not. My hopes are dashed again. So give people some certainty. You know, anyone who's ever done any sales or marketing training knows that before you close a conversation, you set the next meeting. So that's what we need to do here. We need to set the next meeting and, and, and because it's all about staying connected. Please understand your mom receiving the best care possible. We're going to keep you posted on her progress. In the meantime, is there anything I can do for your food or transportation? Can I help you make phone calls? Do you need a minister? Here's my business card. Don't hesitate to call me. I feel so bad for you. I'm sorry. So that's an example. You know, that's a very generic example of what empathy should look like uh, post-event. Let's, let's kind of dissect those slides because, again, there's a lot of teaching in those slides and a lot of things that, you know, we need to tease out for frontline staff so that they're, you know, kind of have a checklist in their mind of what they need to be saying and thinking and doing as they're having these, you know, difficult conversations with patients and families. Well, first, who says it? You know, that's a classic question. Who, who's, who's in there doing that? Well, it depends. 
uh, I'd like to have the doctor or the nurse or whoever the clinicians are that were involved in that care or who have the relationship with the family uh, or the patient uh, having that conversation, but that may not always be achievable. Maybe the doctor is a lousy communicator, maybe the, uh, the doctor is emotionally devastated uh, and is un unconsolable, or maybe the family is so angry at the clinician right now that we don't want to put you know, the doctor in there, we'll put her partner in there, we'll put the nursing manager in there, we'll send the chaplain. Every case is different. You know, this, this, is a, this is not a recipe we're giving you today. This is a, you know, a moral framework or ethical guidelines that you know, you're going to have to adapt to every case. I'd like to have two people if possible. Um, yeah, obviously, if it's over the phone, you're not going to have two people, but if, if you're in person, two people uh, for moral support or witness function, and obviously that second person can you know, haul the conversation out of the ditch if the first person throws them in the ditch. Uh, remember body language. You know, remember what I, I said earlier, my, my first takeaway, sit down, right? You know, sitting down is so important. Don't cross your arms, don't cross your legs. Uh, sit on the edge of your chair, lean forward, look up a little bit, look people in the eye, slow down. You've probably all figured out by now I'm a very fast talker. That's just how God made me. But even fast talkers um, need to slow down in this context. And you know what? When people, I don't care if you're a slow talker naturally, when you're delivering bad news to somebody, it's the natural inclination to start talking real fast. You raise your voice up like this, like Mickey Mouse. So you need to slow it down and you need to drop it down a level or two. And pregnant pauses are okay. Uh, it's uncomfortable. You know, that dead space, that, that, that empty space is uncomfortable, but you need to give people time to absorb this information. You need to give time for them to reflect on what you're saying. And, and every so often ask some open-ended questions is, do you need me to review anything again? Is, is this making sense? What questions do you have of me? What needs do you have of me? You want to, you know, I've had so many clinicians say, well, gee, I, I, you know, I did the disclosure meeting. I was in and out in five minutes. I, I talked. They said nothing. Uh, it was great. And my response back is, well, yeah, I hope it was great. Because uh, the problem is, you know, we don't know what the family's thinking. Because you didn't get, you didn't shut up long enough to give them a chance to say anything. You didn't ask them any open questions. You didn't, you know, you gave a speech. You didn't, you know, in, in, engage in a dialogue. So we need to engage in a dialogue. And then, of course, you know, last bullet point. Remember the setting, the location. You know, you know, healthcare is a noisy environment. A lot of times, you need to, you know, pull these conversations off to the side. You don't want to have them in the hallway. You want to have them out, you know, in a private room. Turn off the cell phones and pages. Don't put them on vibrate. A lot of docs make that mistake. They keep it on vibrate, and it just destroys the conversation. Because at the very minimum, you know, even if the doc ignores the page, which I hope they do, the family's sitting there thinking, well, why aren't you answering that page, and who else did you malpractice today because you're not taking their phone call, doc? I mean, it just, it just, it can blow a hole in a very delicate conversation. So be very thoughtful about this. As I often tell people, think like a funeral director. So what was said with the empathetic, I'm sorry, we, 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 we said I'm sorry, we said it several times was empathy, you know, it's a big deal. We personalized the empathy, we talked about the grandkids' birthday party, again, we were date and time specific, no mush statements, no, we'll get back to you, we were 3 p.m. tomorrow afternoon, is that a good time to meet? We show we're taking the situation seriously, you know, people sue because no one says sorry, people also sue because, you know, they have a feeling, people like me, patients and families, my family's been through, you know, two or more times, you know, we had a feeling that no one was taking it seriously, it was a blow off and, and you know, it was just kind of, a, you know, oh, well, you know, hopefully they go away. So you looked at the verbiage in those slides, uh, very serious action oriented stuff. We talked about body language, sitting down, leaning forward, that also screams, I'm serious. Customer service elements, you know, one of the, the challenges that docs and nurses get into when they have these discussions is they want to launch into the medical, when a lot of times, we don't know what happened medically, and it's going to take a while to figure out. And even if the, the patient or family is, you know, asking those questions or, you know, demanding answers about the medical, a lot of times you're just not ready to talk about it. You need to have that honest look back. So a way you can shift the conversation is by is stuff you can do right now. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Can I can I sit here with you till the minister comes? Can I make sure you get home safe? Uh, can I put you up in a hotel night? Those are all little things uh, which in the big scheme are really pocket change, but they mean a lot. It, it's all about about staying connected. What was not said, there was no omission of fault, not yet. Uh, we only admit fault after we've done our review. Well, well Doug, what if it's, um, you know, one of those, you know, sentinel events, you know, never events, uh, wrong side surgery. Well, okay, fine. Uh, I'm sorry we cut, you know, I'm sorry we operated your dad's left knee. We're supposed to operate on his right knee. I apologize for that mistake occurring. I need to figure out how that mistake occurred. So, you know, yeah, you talk about what you know, but you only say what you know when you know. You don't throw colleagues under the bus. You don't throw yourself under the bus. You know, uh, 
spec joining is not only not good for an organization, it's not good for a family. Because once they hear words like error malpractice, they'll never, they'll never come off of that. Even if the review shows there was no mistake made. So again, we're quick to say we're sorry, we're quick to empathize, we're quick to sit down, and we're quick to, you know, uh, do all those things, do customer service, but, you know, we, you know, we, we pause for a minute of fault. How do you document after empathy? You, you need to document. If, if you don't document these conversations, that they didn't happen. Uh, one thing you may consider as you go forward is you do your documentation and you have these, you know, we talk with the family too, we discuss the following, we said we're going to meet again. Three, uh, it's some, somehow, some way flagging the chart or flagging the EMR because one of the challenges we've learned in working with frontline staff is that, you know, if an event happens on, say, Tuesday, and the patient is still with us on Friday. You know, new staff coming in, new colleagues that are interacting with that patient or family may not know what happened back on Tuesday, and they may, you know, inadvertently screw up all the good work that's been done up to that point. You know, they may step into a pothole. So, so how can we alert them? Uh, you know, there's low-tech ways from, you know, putting a vase of artificial flowers in the room or putting a little, some sort of little flag on the outside of the door to, you know, with EMR, turning the screen pink or orange or whatever, just something that, you know, slaps people in the head and says, hey, pay attention here. Something, something bad happened here. We need to recover this relationship. After the empathy, call somebody. And this is the slide that, you know, to be honest, my my, uh, my risk managers, my, my defense attorneys, general counsel, C-suite, they love. Because, the, you, know, you know, for those of you on the phone that are in that area, risk, uh, uh, defense, uh, C-suite, you know the thing that drives you bananas is an event happens on January 28, 2016, and you don't find out about the event until July 1st, 2016, and you're learning about it not from your staff, but from a lawyer calling saying, I need the records for the Smith family. So, uh, you know, getting staff to call. And, and, you know, one of the things we've learned as we've gone out and done training with frontline staff, sometimes they'll push back and say, well, you know what, we don't know who to call. We, we honestly don't know who to call. And, and, and this is not from residents and nurses working their first day at the hospital. These comments are coming from docs and nurses who have worked in the same facility for 10, 20 years. And, you know, the risk manager will be sitting right next to the to the to to that chief surgeon, and she'll be pulling her hair out. I'll say, I've told you guys 20 times. We've done all those in-houses and that. And I'll say, well, I said, well, okay, stop. I say, time out. Well, look, we've got a disconnect here. I'm sure you've told them 20 times. But obviously the message is not getting to the frontline staff. And when something goes wrong, they, they, not only they not been trained on what to say. They they don't even know to, who to pick up the phone and call. Uh, they just don't know. So one of the, the, the you know the workarounds or one of the solutions we've come up to that is is putting up hotline numbers. And I'll never forget a surgeon in Minneapolis saying you know or up in Minnesota saying you know he said yeah I'm a busy guy and the the, the, the there's only five, the, the only five minutes of my day that is not you know feeling like a pinball and a pinball machine is when I'm sitting in the bathroom on the, on the throne. I'm, he said, what I'm looking at, I said, for five minutes I'm sitting there looking at the, the back of a gray stall, a the stall door. Put the hotline number there. I'll remember if you put it there. Uh, you know, and they also said, put little note cards on the hospital, something I can put in my, my lab coat or stick in my locker or whatever. Yeah, so we need to take that excuse away. We need to make it easy for people to do the right thing. So key messages, again, for frontline staff. Uh, sit down, say you're sorry, uh, and then call someone. So um, that is how I train this stuff, or partially how the way I train this stuff when I go out and work with people in the field. And I love working with folks in the field. It's 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 fun to get on airplanes. It's fun to go out there and do these things and meet people. But you know, the fact of the matter is, I can't be everywhere all the time. I can't be in airports and hotels 365. And, and moreover, as we all know, you know, I, I come in and do a grand rounds or a series of grand rounds type presentations or a day of training seminars. I, I'm only touching a fraction of your staff, and then that says nothing of the new resident that will come in July or the new doc or the new practice you'll be buying next year or the new nurse you'll be hiring three years from now. How do we how do we get the message to those people because they're just as important as the people uh, you have now. In fact, those, those future people are even more important in my mind's eye because they're the ones that are going to keep it going for you. So that's why we have teamed up. We at Sorry Works have teamed up with the Sullivan Group to take the content that you just heard and a whole lot more content that we have and put it into their system in an online program that you know people can access. Uh, anytime, you know, on a Friday evening, a Saturday morning, that, you know, as I talk to people, I think stuff like this, an online pro pro program, should be part of your onboarding process for new practices, new doctors, new residents, new nurses. I mean, this should be, you know, how do we handle post-event discussions should be right up there with, you know, filling out the benefits forms and, and, and the W-2 form. It, it's one of those really fundamental things because everybody is going to be confronted with 
bad things. And if they don't know how to do it, they don't know who to call, that's not only a problem for the patient family, it's not only a problem for them as clinicians, it's a problem for the organization. So this is one of the, one of the big tools that we have. Uh, the hospitals and long-term care facilities insurance companies are now looking at this, this, this program with the Sullivan Group to get this content and make it available all the time. And the cool thing is you can track how staff does. It's CME accredited. They have to take a quiz so to make sure they got it. So uh, it, it's a very powerful uh, teaching tool uh, that can really help folks, uh, uh, you know, embrace this message and, and really help it, you know, help the, help the disclosure culture stick within your organization. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Brand to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the specifics of how, how, the, how, how, this, how this program works within a healthcare system and, and, and how you can uh, take part in it. Brand? Thanks, Doug. And um, just to kind of expand upon the the genesis of the relationship between TSG and SariWorks, it, it is truly because, you know, as you can tell, Doug's message is powerful and practical. And so our, our goal was to take that same message and put it onto our platform so we can scale it out to all frontline clinicians and the 70,000 um, folks that we already work with on our online platform. Next slide. At this point, we have three uh, courses in our curriculum. Um, we have a just-in-time course, an empathy post-event course, and then a fundamentals for leaders. Uh, next slide. So with the just-in-time course, um, and Doug, feel free to jump in here and, and, and add um, additional information about the content, but the thought was this course would be for organizations uh, to make available to their clinicians, as Doug had mentioned, you know, when when they need to know who to call someone, they can also retrieve this video, perhaps p placed on your intranet site, and be able to pull this up. There's no questions, there's no CME, there's no CE. It's, it's strictly a 12-minute video that allows the clinician uh, to gather their thoughts before they're going to go talk to the family after after a bad event. Uh, yeah, so. and that, that, that's how we, yeah, and, and we have a couple of different scenarios in there. We really just try to walk people through what they need to be thinking about. And again, you know, it, it goes through the checklist of what you need to be doing from what you should say, what you should not say, what your body language looks like. And as Brant said, it's a great resource for for folks who are, you know, have to go have that difficult conversation, you know, 20 minutes from now. Again, I also think it's something that it's a great introduction video. For an organization, I think I think this video is the kind of thing you could you could put into your onboarding process. You know, hey, sit down and watch this video for 12 minutes because this is what we need you to be thinking about. You know, when that bad event happens, you know, six months down the road in your employment with us. <clears throat> this next course, Empathy Post Event, is relatively new. Some folks on the call may know uh, of our relationship that we formed uh, about a year and a half ago and, and some of the courses that we've been able to deliver, but this new Empathy Post Event course was really in response to uh, some of our clients being a little less, um, a little more reserved on on making the fundamentals course, which is, which is next, available to everyone. So our thought was, same way that the just-in-time course should be available to all frontline clinicians, so should this empathy post-event course, which stops short of, of going through uh, the resolution and, and anything else that perhaps risk and administration may want to keep to themselves. But, but this empathy post-event course is designed to, uh, to, to target really all, all frontline clinicians within an organization. Doug, anything to add? Yeah, you know, yeah, and it follows up on the just in time. This is basically just in time, but you're 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 giving some deeper contents, a, a deeper dive uh, for folks uh, who want to learn a little bit more about why this is important, why it exactly works, uh, why it's important to patients and families, and and, and the benefit to them as clinicians. So it's uh, it's 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 a deeper dive in, into this uh, this issue and, and helps people understand why this is good stuff. And this course does carry continuing medical education and nursing education as well. Right. And then the last course in the series is uh, Communication Resolution Fundamentals for Leaders. And, and really this course is kind of soup to nuts, everything you would need to know about communication resolution. It uh, goes through different case-based scenarios, as many of our online education does. And as you can see from many of the screenshots, we incorporate a lot of video content of Doug narrating and also acting out some of these scenarios for the, for the clinicians to learn from. Doug, anything else? 
Yeah, and, and this is this is really the the, the deep dive, and it, it's 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 good for not only front, so some frontline staff, but it's especially good for you know risks, claims, legal uh, leadership within the organization. Your CMO, your CNO, some of your nursing managers. I tell you, one client, uh, I was doing a series of trainings where they had a hundred people come in and do train the trainer with me. So we we spent basically half a day with groups of twenty five. Before those folks came in and did that, however, they had to take this course, and it was terrific because it really you know, it put them that many steps ahead when they walked in the door, and it really enriched our conversations during the train the trainer. We were able to get to some meatier content a lot quicker. So it's it's a terrific course uh, that you can weave into your training, or it can be a standalone, whatever works best for you and your organization. So in summary, um, there's really a number of ways that we work with organizations on deploying this 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 program. Um, one way is we can kind of work together with SARIWorks and Doug, and if you're interested in doing some of his on-site leadership training, we could kind of bake that into some of the online courses that we provide, similar to what Doug just outlined about perhaps getting folks up to speed on certain critical issues uh, through the online education, and then Doug can come on site and, and advance the conversation further with leadership. Also, we can open up and, and, and host uh, webinar forums for clients as well. So a number of different ways to work with, with organizations on making sure that all front Frontline clinicians and the entire organization is embracing the culture of communication resolution and, and disclosing uh, adverse events. And, and you know, for the financial folks, they're they're absolutely at this point. You know, in addition to this just being the right thing to do, uh, there is absolutely an ROI that is to be had by by executing on a, a good communication resolution program, um, financially speaking. And we're happy to have those discussions as well. Next slide. So at this time, uh, that concludes our, our webinar, but we would hope that folks might want to stay on and ask Doug any questions about the content that he just delivered and the message he just delivered, or if anyone has any questions about the way we work with organizations to help augment their existing communication resolution training programs. Great. Well, thank you, Doug, and thank you, Brant. Uh, I have a few questions uh, coming in now. Uh, Doug, the first one is for you. What's the biggest challenge that you're seeing in communication and disclosure right now as you work with organizations? It's getting that frontline staff, um, getting getting those folks trained. Um, you know, it's such a big organization, a big population. I I did a, I did a, um, a webinar yesterday. I was actually kind of was a you know point counterpoint you know, with a with a trial or a person who was a little bit not too supportive of disclosure. You know because. I don't think she really understood what the thing was going on. Her her comment or her criticism was, well, 81% of doctors don't think uh, apology is going to make any difference when it comes to reducing litigation. That an apology won't won't do anything to to get a family not to sue. And, and, my, and my comeback to that point was, well, it's probably about 81% or more of docs who have been trained on disclosure and apology. You know, they, they just hear these flippant things about say you're sorry, you won't get sued, and, and that's not enough. They really need to get an understanding of what this means, how it works, what they need to say, what they shouldn't say, uh, and, 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 and more importantly, how an organization working together can resolve a situation with a patient or with a family. You know, there's too many docs running around today thinking, well, if I hurt somebody or worse, I kill somebody, a family has to sue me to get money or get any type of justice. And, well, that's certainly an avenue people can take, but there ought to be another way. And that, that's what disclosures are all about, is, is how do we keep people working together. So, you know, just getting, getting clinicians trained. And when, when, you, when you go in, the cool thing is when you go in and train docs and nurses and you go through that content we just went through and, and, and more of the content that we have, it really opens their eyes. I mean, these are intelligent people and they can work through it like, oh, yeah, that, that, that does make sense. And, gee, that's what I would want if something like this happened to me. So, gee, I can see how that would work. So, yeah, it's some matter training. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, Brant, this next question is for you. How do you price the online program? Sure. There's a number of different ways. Um, if, if the organization is interested in just you know, kind of identifying a set group of physicians and nurses, maybe a smaller group that they want to, to train, we could really just go per, per doc and per nurse and, and, and license the courses that way. Uh, and it would range between um, you know, 52 to $100 per person. Uh, depending on which courses and, and how many people. If the organization is interested in doing kind of enterprise-wide, we want everyone within the, you know, all clinicians, all employees of the organization to be trained on 
on um, communication resolution. Then we would go per discharge, and we would just um, look at the number of discharges that organization has and price it that way. And again, that would range anywhere between a dollar to a dollar fifty per discharge. Great, thank you. If someone were interested in getting access to the online courses, uh, is that possible? And what's the next step? Yes, they can um, email myself, Doug, anyone who, um, in, you know, anyone invited you to this webinar today, please get in contact with them. You can email me at the Sullivan Group account, and we will get you folks set up with um, demo access to some of the courses. Yeah, so so that people can preview them and take a look at them and, and ask questions going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to help folks. Great. So. Doug, this sounds like a question for you. Um, what do you say to someone who's struggling with a, a CEO or a CFO who says the money isn't there right now for disclosure um, or they're too busy? Yeah, you know, getting the attention of C-suite is, is always a challenge. You know, too often they're they're thinking about the next practice they want to buy. Are they going to merge that hospital across town? Are they going to be bought out by that hospital across town. Uh, so, you know, getting on getting on their radar is challenging. And then, then of course, the excuse is, well, you know, money's tight and, you know, this, that, and the other. And I, and I always come back and say, you know, look, you're just one phone call. You know, the next phone call that, that hits your cell phone or the, the phone in your office could be someone saying, guess what, we're getting sued again. And, and we all know how expensive uh, that can be. Um, and, you know, some estimates say the average lawsuit blows a seven to $800,000 hole in the hospital's budget because it's, it's the litigation expenses, it's the lost staff time, it, it's the loss of reputation in the community. There's all sorts of ways that that, you know, that, that, that eats at the bottom line. So, you know, saying we don't have money is not an excuse because, you know, you, you know, whatever you would spend on this, if you can just reduce one lawsuit, which you will, in fact, you'll reduce more than one lawsuit, uh, the return on investment, it, it's there. You, you just got to make the investment up front and then you will reap the rewards down the road. So it, it's, an, it's an issue you can't ignore because you, know, you, you can't ignore your phone. <laughs> you can't ignore your email. Uh, those calls, those emails are coming. So the question is to the CFO or the CEO, you know, those phone calls are coming. Nothing we can do to stop, you know, people from calling us. Question is, can we, can we reduce those number of phone calls saying someone's suing us, someone is hauling a docs to the medical board, whatever. Thanks, Doug. Uh, another question came in. Uh, there's a lot of consultants out there saying that they have an effective program in this area. Uh, how do folks know that what we do is effective? So, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of people uh, doing this. Uh, I think the thing that the way I would answer that is we've been doing this this work for gee 11 years now and i think i can say without you know banging the chest too hard or or being too boisterous you know sorry works was kind of really one of the first ones to get out there and do this and i'm glad that other people are out there training and 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 putting this thing out there uh, but we've we've gotten all this content out through all these years i think you know at some point you got to say Gee, something that's been around 11 years that's been in that many hospitals has put out that much content, books, booklets, webinars, you name it, uh, something must be working. Uh, the message must be getting accepted. People are having good experience with it. They're telling their friends or colleagues, and those people are calling and having uh, similar good experience. I think the, the thing that makes, you know, sorry it works a little different uh, than most is it's, it's driven from the patient and family perspective. You know, it, it's great to, you know, get docs and nurses and lawyers involved, but at the end of the day, the, the person that drives the bus when something goes wrong, it's an angry patient or an angry family. I've been through it twice in my family. So that's the passion I bring into this. Uh, that's the perspective I bring to your clinicians uh, when, we, when we sit down and talk and, and try to get them educated. You know, I say, look, I, you know, if you don't want someone like me to sue you, here's what, you know, I need you to do for me. <laughs> Here's the things that we need to go through. And, and some of them, again, when, 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 when they do it, it, it works. So, you know, it's a track record and a perspective that I think that sets us apart. Thanks, Doug. Uh, if someone wanted just the 12-minute video or just one piece of the training, uh, is that possible? And what's the cost associated with that? 
Yes, it is possible, and we would need the number of learners that it's going to be made available to and or the number of discharges of that organization. So we can price it based on the number of learners or the number of discharges for that organization. And they can contact me. We actually chatted my email address so they can reach out to me directly and I can give them a more accurate um, gauge on that pricing. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, we So attendees know we are recording this webinar and we'll make the video available. We'll send it out via email by early next week. Uh, but Doug or Brandt, do you have any tips to help folks on the call today gain buy-in for their organization to purchase a program like this? Brandt, you want to go first? Sure. I think... Um, you know, I think from our perspective, we have a lot of conversations with organizations that are interested in investing in, in a number of our other programs as well as this program. And so I think there's always got to be the financial uh, case that, that is made um, to get folks comfortable and to get them on board with this. Regarding participation in these types of programs, I, I um, you know, and Doug, please feel free to chime in, but I think I think that the movement has been is, is shifted so much in, in favor of doing these types of programs that uh, clinicians and, and, and organizations do want to get on board, but they might be a little apprehensive, perhaps for some uh, state law reasons and other things like that that might be um, may have limited them from participating in the past. But now I think the pendulum swung enough where organizations are buying in. They do want to participate, but they want to do it the right way, and they want to make sure that they're doing it in a way that doesn't overexpose them or put them in a more vulnerable position. Doug, do you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, the thing is, you know, it's always, it, my thing that's always fascinated, fascinated me about this work and this topic, you know, now in my 11th year is I don't know how many times I've gone out to a hospital or getting ready to come out to a hospital or a long-term care facility or working with an insurance company and, you know, you're dealing with the risk manager or whoever the host is and they'll say, you know, gee, you know, we're hoping to get a good crowd and, you know, Grand rounds can be kind of a sleepy affair, and and you know we're sorry if we don't get many people, and and you know every time they end up eating those words, uh, because uh, you know you put this talk out there, you put this content out there, you put a course like we're talking about these online courses out there, and people just naturally gravitate towards it. It's one of those topics that it, it's just a hot topic in healthcare. It's in traditionally you know, the whole issue of how do we handle errors? What are we going to do with the patient? What are we going to do with the family? What are we going to do with the doctor and nurse? You know, those are just it's a historically hot, uh, controversial topic. And even if people disagree with you or think it's a bad idea, they'll want to come here just to hear what you're saying. So it, it's amazing. I've always been amazed by how people just gravitate towards this thing. And, you know, I've had naysayers say, well, you know, the docs aren't ready for this. The nurses aren't comfortable. I'm not sure, whatever. And it's amazing how you go out and speak to those docs and nurses. They're ready for it. They've been ready for it for 20 years. Uh, you know, they wish they would have had this in nursing school or medical school. So those those folks are ready. You can't let the excuses get in the way of it. And, and you, you put this out there in the, in the format that we have, your people will gravitate towards it, and, and your folks can get a lot of value out of it. Great. Thank you both. Uh, one more here. What do you feel is the most effective way of teaching empathy, online versus face-to-face role-playing or something else? I think, you know, you have to have a combination. You know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, if, if I could be on an airplane 365 days out of the year and be in all these hospitals, uh, you know, gee, that would be great. And if we had, you know, other people like that, that that's terrific. But that's not reasonable. And, and furthermore, you need to come back and even, you know, if I did a training tomorrow with 50 docs and it all went gangbusters, we still want to keep reinforcing this thing with these people. So I think, you know, is is when I talk to healthcare and insurance organizations, I say, guys, you need to think about this as building a program. You know, this cannot just be a policy and then a couple of days of training and boom, we're off and that's it. It needs to be a program where it has staying power. And I think part of uh, developing that staying power is having tools. Um, uh, and a really great tool is to have this in an online format because, again, you can, you know, you may have the greatest training set up and you bring me or someone else in and we do, you know, you do a couple of days and everyone's all pumped up, but you maybe only touched a small fraction of your organization. What about that doc that couldn't make it because they're doing surgery or they're out of town or they're sick? You need, to, you need to connect with that person. These online tools can be a great way to connect, get them the messaging, and help them understand some of the basics enough that they'll maybe want to follow up with the risk manager and say, well, I saw that video. That was great. How, how, 
let's walk through this some more. So I, it, it's one of those important tools. And at the end of the day, you've got to have a, you know a multi multifaceted approach: in person, written materials, online, uh, all sorts of things that really kind of immerse people in this, get them trained, and and keep them focused on it, keep the eye on on the ball. Great. Thank you so much, Doug. And with that, we will close today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for logging in. It's um, and. Doug, thank you to you for all this valuable information. Uh, as a reminder, we will be circulating the video from this webinar via email by early next week. Uh, if for some reason it doesn't come through, you can also log on to our website at thesullivangroup.com and access our recorded webinars onto the Resources tab. Thank you, everyone, for logging in today, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.